Sorry, one second. One. He's PJ. Hello there. I'm the Dean, and we are the Books Boys. The one and only. This is the Books Boys show. Get it? Buy it? Books. Books. And we're joined by little Alfred. There he is. There he is. So it's Books Boys, PJ, because there are multiple books and multiple boys. We have two are... boys and a bear. How many books do we oh. have? I, I've, we got we got All a bit more than three. I can tell you that. <laughs> we got a lot of books. A lot but of books. books. What's it all about, Dean? You know, books. It's, you know, I think, how long have we been speaking about books now? It's been? It has been one year exactly. It's the one year, <laughs> the one year anniversary show. Oh anniversary of time. Wow, okay. Oh my God, that's crazy, guys. So we've been one year to get talking about books. Now, I know it's about paper, but I'm still not, I'm still finding myself going to the, you know, super value and so, looking at the toilet paper section and looking for Orwell. And having difficulty finding Orwell. You can't get him there, man. I don't know. It, it's this kind of thing, right? Scrolls. I've got some papers here that I can write on. Is, is this books? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's newspapers. I, I, I just, look, guys, it's still a mystery, but I hope you're starting to get in, in a vague platonic idea of what a book might platonically look like. The, the platonic form, the, the perfect book, it exists out there in the, in the realm of platonic uh, beings, you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and not only is it our one year anniversary episode um it's halloween to, literally today we're recording on halloween spooky so everyone pause the show no don't do that after the show go and uh, watch some uh, freddy krueger you know spooky and read some spooky books as spooky well Spooky books i have a really good spooky recommendation later and, oh, yeah. and pj i've been i've been inundating you with pictures of my myriad halloween costumes this year <laughs> And did you have this? It's been very exotic. All from, oh, what, what, is, what was it again? From the Little Red Riding Hood to. I was a devil. I was Little Red Riding Hood. I was Antonio Banderas from Desperado. I liked that one. That was good. Yeah, you've been all over the place sending me all these pictures. Good Lord. And I was also I think... posing with a pumpkin in, in a forest at one point. So I, I don't know, I'm on a hay bale. I'm, I'm a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. We we're just talking about that. Dean has recently joined. He's, he's a very proactive. He'd be very, he'd be very suitable in an Athenian society where they just indulge themselves in all kinds of activities. I believe you've been indulging yourself in the Irish Orwell Society. Dean, joining. Yes, I, 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 I took some some classes. I'm still still doing a ten week course on Orwell. The course is called Orwell in Ireland, well, but we realized that he didn't really do anything with Ireland, so it's now just become minute <laughs> details about Orwell's life. You know. Maybe it's one trip to Dublin, explain in great detail. And I believe you've also joined the, the Oldster University Skiing Society and your painting. So I just I'm imagine reading and, a book, yeah, painting, everything. skiing, skiing over a place. Yeah. I'm skiing well, down the slopes whilst painting and reading and making music and everything we're all at once. We're, so. we're reading Orwell specifically and trying to try to find this Irish connection. I like it. Yeah, it, it is, there's not. Well, his one of his wives was Irish, but he never talked about it. So uh, having a class about Orwell in Ireland, there's, there's, there's not much to go on. It's, a, it's unfortunate. But man, we're going to talk about some books. Oh, and we should mention briefly, um, we actually saw each other in person this month. We did indeed. We did indeed. We did some and Halloween suit, activities. And, and the back of your car was literally full of Orwell books. That's the whole. <laughs> it was. Really it was, yeah. was literally full of Orwell books. I didn't know he even read. I wrote that much. So you only yeah. wrote like six notes. It was full of it. Oh, and was, altogether, he's got nine plus stories and essays, and a lot. He wrote a lot, actually. Um, but yeah, we saw each other, and we took a lot of wacky photos. Indeed. So they're all going to be up on Instagram soon. These um, are very, very posing photos, everyone. If you want to see some mm, interesting photos, risque, maybe. Yeah? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Infant terrible photos. Well, let's let's start, PJ. The first the first book I read this month. I, well, this, I don't know why this is not a surprise. It's Orwell. Oh my god, it's, uh, it's our Burmese one. Days. Have you heard of this one even? You might not have. I've I've heard of the title, but I don't know what's about. Is it is it uh, journalism or is it a novel? It's a novel. So a lot of Orwell's novels, some of some some of them are a bit more journalistic. This hmm. one is fictional, but it is, hmm. you know, so he did have some real Burmese days, you know, like he went over to Burma right. as a as a police officer. And so oh, yes. it is kind of there's some realism in it, but it is a fictional story. Um, this one. Okay. Essentially, what happens is it, sorry guys, I know that we got a lot of listeners in England. Um 
this is an anti-British Empire uh, book, essentially. So, oh, you know, it, it's effectively, you know, he's over there and they're all working and some of them are officers and some of them are just working for private companies. Um, but the attitudes that they have, like towards the locals, like the natives, you know, they, they treat them like dirt. They, 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 they insult them. And, and, you know, it really gives you an idea about the way the British Empire worked. And it's really quite depressing at times and bits of it can be can be difficult to read just with like rampant racism and hatred to be honest and but he's exposing it which is which is good you know mm. wow okay yeah that's his, is that that's his first novel isn't it yeah it is it, it's not his very first one i don't think but it's an early one i'm reading them all but i'm reading them all out of order um okay it might be his first one actually i don't know but i've read that one and so i'll give you a bit of an, an idea of the story so there's this chap called Yupo Kin, and he's a local, but he's managed to get himself a little, not a governorship, but a kind of some, some kind of position of power amongst the locals. Um, but he's just corrupt. Um, and there's a bit that says the way he does his corruption is he takes a bribe from both sides and then decides the case on purely legal grounds so as to be impartial. But he takes bribes from both sides anyway. So he's just making money left, right and center. And he's just this big, you know, obese, fat guy who's, you know, just sitting scoffing the food with his hands and raking in money and just corruption and you know but um he there's this doctor called dr Vereshwamy, and he really wants to join this club of white people because he believes that they they both want to join but for different reasons yeah. and they believe that this will kind of boost their social standing you know so that so then yupo kin the official decides to discredit the doctor um, in order to to get himself recognized by the, the the white people who are running the empire effectively because all he cares about is not even money but just like status and fame and he just wants to like improve his own standing but all the while he has a wife who's giving him all this um why are you such a nasty man essentially like why why are you all, everything you want to do is morally corrupt and of course it's an orwell book so it's sad that in the end he manages to corrupt the wife you know um, oh, and the voice of reason is is gone. Do you know, there's a really interesting thing about these Orwell books. They're all very different settings, um, but they're all very, very the same as well. Okay. You know, it, they are Orwellian, you know, and, and they have those same threads running through them. And it, so the themes, yeah. Yeah, and the way he has his characters, I always, I always like his characters because even though some of them are really not good people, they, you think that they're trying and they always notice that the world around them isn't right. And that's sometimes how I feel in the world. So I, I empathize with them a little bit, you know. Like the classic 1984, but this is a more is, historical or or let's just say a journalist aspect rather than a dystopian fantastic yeah. one. Okay. I'll give you a couple of quotes, ideas about the way they treat the, the locals. So there's a guy, they're, 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 the locals are usually working like as their servants and things, you know, and they're complaining, you know, oh, in the old days, you didn't have to pay them as much. And, uh, you know, in the old days, you could just beat them. And nowadays, there's all these rules, you know, and it's un unfair for us poor rich white people to have to follow rules and not beat our servants, you know. And they say, the, the only way I can even keep a servant nowadays is to pay their wages several months late. You know, it's the only way I can manage, you know, <laughs> not, not thinking this for a chap's not getting his wages you know it's just the disregard the lack of humanity that's obviously very influenced by um naturalism and that late late 19th century novels like Emile Zola mm -hmm. that basically they show realism the gritty side of realism everyone everything going down the drains realism and uh, Orwell did say actually he said in um why I write he said that he wanted to write enormous, enormous naturalistic novels with unhappy endings. Yeah, and um, yeah, and that he said that the first book uh, that that Burmese days was rather that kind of book. So it is, and it's one that you know Orwell wasn't happy with a lot of his early books, and um, but he did he did accept this one. So, some some of them he wanted to take out of print, like you know even we reviewed before keep the Aspidistra flying, which I love. He thought it was garbage. You know? <laughs> he said, like, didn't want to print it. And the clergyman's daughter, which I haven't read yet, you know, he actually stopped that being printed for a while. And then eventually he said, well, when he was dying, like, well, yeah, someone might make a bit of money off it. So I guess he didn't print it, but you know, it's, it's garbage. You know, wow. So. wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. He was only ever, to be honest, I think he was really only happy with the two famous ones, with Animal Farm in 1984, to be honest. Okay. I think those are the only two that he was really happy, you know, thrilled about. Wow. Well, some of us were our worst critics, so. Yeah, that. Um, but there's a, a lot of this stuff. There's a part where they actually say, you know, they're complaining about about the Indians and the natives, and they say, you know, one day we'll show them, one day we'll leave, and then what will they do without us? 
so I don't know, be be free and and not have not be controlled. I don't know, but they have this idea that they're there to improve. But the main character, Flory, he knows they're not, and he keeps saying to to the doctor, Vereshwami, who he's friends with, he keeps saying, "We're doing bad things here." I and I accept that, but if we would at least be honest about it, you know, we're we're, we're telling this lie that we're here to like improve the lives of the natives, and we're not. We're just robbing them. And, you know, mm. he just can't deal with, like, the hypocrisy of, of the world around him. He's like, look, if we're going to do bad things, we can at least admit it. You know, that's kind of his. So he's not he's not a hero, but he's he's doing trying to do something, you know. Mm-hmm. Wow. OK. Um, and there's a love story because every book needs a little love story. Um, and he meets well, this girl. So 1984. Yeah. Yeah. He meets this girl. Um, but, you know, Elizabeth, she she's really he likes her because she's basically the only young pretty girl there. So it's a pretty easy choice. Um, and she's so cold with him. You know, she, she wants him to be this macho manly guy that he's not. And, but he's friends with some of the locals. You know, he's friends with the Indian doctor, Vereshwami. And he gets a lot of stick from the other white people for, being fr- for, for not being racist, essentially. Um, and for trying to be a good guy. And she finds this so repulsive that she, she, she falls out of love with him. She's like, I can't. You know, she wouldn't even speak to him. And there's a horrible scene where he falls off a horse and he's hurt and he's bleeding and he's half mangled, falling off this horse. And he calls out to her and she just ignores him. She doesn't care because, she, you know, oh. he's not who she thought he was. He's, he's not a bad person, essentially. So she just snubs him and doesn't care if he lives or dies almost, you know. Wow. Okay. So it's it's sad, actually, in, in parts. Um, but your chap, you, you, you poke in, he actually tries to orchestrate a revolution so that he can then come in and stop his own revolution and look like a hero. Oh, um, wow. but, the, but the real hero is Flory. Flory is, is the only... He's not a hero, sorry, I said before, but he's the only good person, really, you know, in the book. Yeah. Or he's the only person t- trying, you know. Um, and it's, in part, it's, it's a really addictive book, and it's a short book. It's only a couple hundred pages, and I read it very, very quickly, um, and it's it's an addictive one, but just the attitudes of the, of the locals are, are bad. There's not a lot of... A, there's not a lot of a story, really. It's more just, you know... He's struggling with the world around him, with the empire, and then there's this re- little revolution, and that's that's more or less it, you know. So it's a portrait of Burma in those times, as it was the British Empire, and I suppose he was very influenced by, you know, that you know British literature has a, a series of writers who are also travelers and critics of their own British Empire. I mean, you've got Joseph Conrad, who was Polish, but he wrote in English and really criticized, particularly mm. imperialism around the world but in English but more specifically you got Somerset Maugham you know he, he the great short story writer I, I loved his work when mm-hmm. I was a teen writing these little short stories that always portrayed kind of white privileged classes yeah. and how like how they're kind of abusing the natives and how like, how out of contact they are how disconnected they are with them but also with themselves and how the British Empire is just and it's just stagnant, you know, at that point. This was written in the 30s, and Somerset Mon is also right in the 2030s. Mm. It just becomes very stagnant, this British Emperor. Very, it's time to let it go. <clears throat> you get this feeling before the Second World War. I love authors who are trying to say this. Yeah. And from, from doing the Orwell classes, I mean, the interesting thing about Orwell is he, he was against... I don't know if he was against the empire per se, but he definitely knew that like change was needed, you know, um, up and up until the second world war started. And then he became, you know, he kept saying, we've got to stop the war effort. Like this is, you know, he was really, really against it. He was really anti-war. Um, and then as soon as the war started, he just flipped and became like a patriot and wanted to help, you know, but I, I suppose if you think that you're, at, at, that can happen. If you feel that you're at risk, like, you know, then, then you, you, you might become a patriot, I guess. I don't know. Hmm, interesting. But there's a chap I love called Verrill, and he's a military officer, and he just goes around on, on the nicest horses and, you know, orders everyone around, and he's very... <laughs> Elizabeth eventually falls in love with him um, instead of poor Flory, uh, because Flory's not, you know... The only time she really cares about Flory is when he, he takes her hunting, and it's a horrible scene where they're just killing these poor animals, you know, and it's... A lot of the stuff doesn't hold up today, actually. But um, the guy Verrill, he's the sort of chap who just... He's sitting reading his newspaper, you know, and you come over to him and you ask him something, and he, say, he says... Um, things like, you know, my, my, my good chap, when someone gives me lip, I kick their bottom. Do you want your bottom kicked? Okay, if not, you know, go away. And I'll go back to my newspaper, you know. There's a lot of this kind of like posh British stuff, which, which I always find humorous. That's one of my favorite, yeah. uh, favorite you know, f- forms of humor. But <laughs> it's good. And then I moved on and I read this one. Uh, have you heard of this one? Coming up for air. I uh, haven't heard that one. So mm. what's that about? Is that Sim- also by Orwell? 
it's another Orwell one. It's I think it's less than 200 pages. Like these are short books by Orwell. You know, they're not, they're, this isn't uh, Dickens. But you know what? What's funny? You know the trick, right? The Anna Karenina trick of inserting a 700 page uh, farming manual. It's, it's a classic. Well, Orwell makes a mistake of doing that trick in a book that's less than 200 pages long. He introduces 50 pages about fishing. And Lord, okay. that's not ideal. You know, if you've got 800 pages to play with, you can do that. You can do the Dostoevsky method and put a 100 page you know, religious <laughs> narrative or whatever. But if you've only got like 180 pages, you can't be using 50 of them about fishing. Oh, no. He was obviously too inspired and wanted to do the same thing. Oh, he was. And so the fishing manual. This one is no plot, actually. Um, it's this. Oh. But again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a microcosm. It's a picture of someone's life. Yeah. And he's unhappy with the world around him. And it has the fear of the coming war. You know, it's typical, you know, you get it in 1984 and everything, but it's always this, this fear of the society and the war that's coming and this kind of thing. Um, the chap, he, he, he fought in World War I, but he, he was in the, a, a team that did nothing. They sent him to a, on a beach somewhere and forgot about him. And he's just there by himself with this one old, disgruntled old soldier that he doesn't talk to. And he just reads books and thinks like, oh, this war is not so bad. Like, you know, I'm not doing anything. Like they just sent him to an outpost in a team that didn't, he says this, this team doesn't even exist. Like they've put me in a regiment that doesn't exist. I'm getting paid and I'm just chilling, you know? Um, but he's afraid of World War II and he's afraid of Hitler and he's afraid of Stalin and okay. all this kind of stuff, you know? And he has a friend who's a, a literary sort of chap and he sits around, you know, pipe and slippers kind of kind of chap. And he keeps saying, oh, there's nothing new under the sun. Hitler, Stalin now, they're just copying the Greeks and the Romans. And you can't get any conversation out of him that doesn't go back to the Greeks <laughs> and the Romans. Um, and but, but because of that, despite all of his intelligence, he doesn't see the actual upcoming threat. And that's that's what's curious. Um, but this poor chap, George, all he does, he's not a nice, all these Orwell guys, they're not, they're not nice chaps. The only redeeming thing is that I, I empathize with them because they see something wrong in the world, you know? Yeah, so, but so they, all hold, they all hold that in common, right? They all have it, yeah. Okay. Um, but this guy's not likable. I mean, he's cheating on his wife. He's doing all this kind of stuff. He wants to kill his wife at one point, actually. He says, for the, I don't know why I married her. And for the first few years, I seriously thought about killing her. Um, but then afterwards, I just behold her. He, he, he doesn't talk to her enough to really under, get to know her. So he just, he's always curious, like, what are these women doing? Like, I don't, I just don't get them, you know? And it's, it's really weird. You know, he, he went from hating her to just being curious about her, but he always says like, oh, she's not intelligent. She lost her looks, whatever else, you know, and her and her friends go to these talks and he says, oh, they don't understand a word of the talks. They're just, you know, going because they think they're supposed to or whatever he's very, very negative on her and then he disappears for a few days to to you know he wants to go fishing that all he all he ever wants to do is go fishing but the sad part is he never goes fishing all right okay so that's the tragedy yeah he just wants to but he he never has the time he went fishing when he was 15 he's never been since and you know he just really wants to go fishing again <laughs> and everyone says oh grown man fishing that's such a stupid such a stupid idea you know so is that, is that what it's about basically so it talks about fishing the whole time in an abstract sense but nothing ever happens it's just him dreaming about what more or less more yeah. idyllic time. and he goes away for a few days and he goes back to see the town he grew up in because he, he describes there's a big fishing narrative and there's another big narrative where he talks about his childhood days and you know he grew up and you know <laughs> very traditional his dad owned a little shop and the profits were getting worse and worse but his dad kept saying well things will look up presently and he you know he, he never realized oh no the big shop down the street is going to put us out of business you know he just stuck with his old world you know i've ran this little shop for 50 years and it's always been here and we'll keep doing it but it just gets less and less and less profitable as as time goes on and it was a shop that sold like just bird seed and that was it like i, I don't know that's a very profitable business but you know and then the mum, you know she says you know she's, she never leaves the house there's parts of the house she's not even been in you know she's just like i'm in the kitchen all day i'm cooking and, and that's literally it and he thinks, you know, but I had a, it wasn't so bad those days. And he looks at the world around him now and it's all different. And so he goes back to the town of his youth. And of course, it's all changed. It's become a modern city. There's factories and there's workers and it's all different. And he's, he's sad because all he wants to do is recapture something. And he goes and he can't. And he doesn't even tell his wife where he's going. He lies and he's going somewhere else. So she thinks he's having an affair. And he's just kind of like, well, you know, she catches me, whatever. Like sometimes I, she's always, she's always suspicious that I'm having an affair. Sometimes she's right. Sometimes she's wrong. You know, <laughs> he doesn't really seem to mind. But it's all right. But it doesn't sound as captivating of a book. In, in a way, in a way it's not. Um, but there's mundane details that, that really let you, 
Orwell's good at letting you see how depressing the society is, you know? And he talk, he talks about just their dingy little houses and, you know, their salaries and everything. And everyone's the same. A row of houses where essentially every person in it's just the same, you know? And then the sad thing is none of them even own the houses because there was some kind of scam where they ended up buying their own houses on like a really weird loan thing. So, so essentially they're, they're paying them off and paying them off, but they never own them, you know? So would you, uh, <clears throat> do you see a connection between Dickens and Orwell's? Yeah, I think that there are some connections. Um, obviously, it's a different type of society, and, and Orwell mm, yeah. isn't, you know, he doesn't do those, like, almost comically over-the-top characters that Dickens does. Yeah. But but you see the depression in the society, and, you, you know, yeah. there is that similarity, I think, yeah. Wow, okay. Orwell, I, I also actually read some Orwell essays, and one was in defense of Dickens, because around that time, Orwell helped repopularize Dickens. Um, around that time, Dickens was seen as a bit of a silly author, actually. And Orwell wrote this massive essay in praise of how good Dickens really is and actually helped like re repopularize him. Well, so there you go. So obviously he did uh, find, you know, he, he, he obviously was inspired by Dickens. And as you say, he does mention naturalist novels. So what, there was other novels that came after Dickens, turning realism, going one step further, going really into detail. But yeah. yeah. But the honest answer is, Almost nothing happens in this in this book. You know, if I'm being really honest, they they talk a lot about fishing, and he you know he goes back to the town. That's the only real plot point, and and you know nothing even happens when he does go back to the town. He just gets drunk a lot. You know, his wife sits around reading Hilda's Home Companion and sort of thinking, you know, I'll here's how to do things around the house, and and that, and he looks down on her for it, but he never attempts to help her either. You know, he he always says, well, she's got no hobbies, she's got no interests. That's her problem. He doesn't try to help her. He just kind of looks at her like a curiosity. You know, he doesn't try to make any connection with his wife, which is really strange. Okay, okay. Interesting. But So the fishing is always like a metaphor for something idyllic, something that is different, something that is not the present. Oh, yeah, Stalin, Hitler, just around the corner. He tries to get away. So it's escapism. Yeah, it's and he has fishing. kids that he has no interest in either. He's just like, ah, these kids, you know, whatever. Right. Like, he, he doesn't care. You know, he's just not interested at all. It's interesting to read the book because it was published in June 1939. So it'd be interesting to read it as a, like, what did people think, feel just before the war ends are escalating? Mm. And what and is the to have? And then, of course, the line coming up for air appears. And the idea is that he just feels so stuffy and so bogged down in this world that isn't right. And he wants to come up for air. And he says, but there isn't any air. And he's like, wow. we, we are in the dystopia, basically. That's that's what he's saying. You know, he's like, I want to come up for air, but there isn't any. We're living in a garbage place, you know. And it's it hit me as like, yeah, that is also true. You know, so. Wow. Um, and he, he wants to escape, though. So I'll read a quote here. He says he's talking about all these nosy parkers and everyone's, you know, not minding their own business. And he says the Home Secretary, Scotland Yard, the Temperance League, the Bank of England, Hitler, Stalin on a tandem bicycle, a bench of bishops, Mussolini, the Pope. They're all after me. He feels that the whole society, the whole world is chasing him. There's a chap who thinks he's going to escape. There's a chap who thinks he won't be streamlined, you know, but he wants to escape. And he just feels that the whole world is just always crowding in on him and, and he can't escape, you know? Wow. It's a powerful reading. Yeah, but it's, I, I massively recommend Orwell to, to anyone, to be honest. He's, he's brilliant. And the short books, they're very accessible. I, I recommend 1984 to someone on, a, on an almost daily basis because yeah, <laughs> anytime exactly. someone says anything about modern life, I'm like, have you read 1984 though? <laughs> so it's very, it's also like, it always talks about relevant themes that, especially the other ones that are not 1984 coming up for air or Burmese days, which are made more historical now, but they're all related to the fact that society needs to change, that he's always trying to say, look, this is not working society. I'm showing you the present. I'm showing you what could happen in the future as a metaphor. I'm showing you with, with like a fairy tale, like with Animal Farm. He's always, he's always criticizing and making sure that people are not blinded, right? So he's trying, to, he's trying to basically lead the people into what he thinks is a more conscious and uh, society that criticizes the, the bad things rather than just accepts it. Hmm. Yeah, he is. And I'll be honest, I was really, really excited to find that he loved Dickens, but he wrote an article about someone else. He wrote in defense of P.G. Woodhouse. Did you know that? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. No, I did not know. That. He was also a fan of and defender of Woodhouse. Um, I don't remember the wow. details of the article, but I think Woodhouse was so 
politically naive that he you know and at one point like he was um he was on, on nazi radio because he the, 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 i think he just didn't really understand you know and they, they say well, he was soon go ahead yeah he was a not he was uh so woodhouse as we talked about him i'm a big fan of pg woodhouse he was a comic uh comic novelist he was very popular around the 20s and just like fitzgerald afterwards he'd be considered a well we're in the pressure now. Why are you still writing about the 20s? So just like Fitzgerald, he also lost some popularity. People were against him. And he thought he was stuck in that jazz stage. But the reason why he was in the Nazi radio is because he lived in France. And basically the Nazis captured the area around him. And he had to basically it was kind of either go to a concentration camp. I'm not sure if it was quite as severe as that, but it was more or less uh, Fiji either go to a concentration camp or just go on the radio for us and make some uh, comedy bit on the on Nazi radio. And yes, I think you're right. P.G. Woodhouse was not interested in politics. don't think it was a Nazi, though. I don't think it was anything. No, no, it's, it's, not, it's not made clear. The, the point that Orwell makes is that he was so naive that he just didn't really know what he was doing. You know, he says P.G. Woodhouse okay. literally lives in that in that 20s world that he writes about. Like, he doesn't yeah, know he anything else, you know? <laughs> Oh, but what, so why does he, I'm very curious, so what does he like about P.G. Woodhouse? Because I love P.G. Woodhouse, but I don't really see the connection between Orwell mm. and um, It's not even that there's a connection. I think he just liked the books and he, and he wanted to defend him because I, I guess P.G. Woodhouse was getting a bad rap. Um, for a mm. while, people were saying, you know, well, he you know, he essentially did Nazi propaganda radio, so that's enough of a reason to get a bad rap, I guess, you know. And, and Orwell was kind of saying, yeah, but he didn't know what he was doing, you know. He he, he is Worcester. He is, you know, he's, he's living oh, in, right. in, a, in a dream world. <laughs> you got to oh, give him does. give him a buy ball on this one, you know. And they said, look, the world he was writing about, because because Woodhouse lived in America for a long time as well, and they yeah. said, look, the England that he was writing about didn't exist, but he didn't know that because yeah. he wasn't there. So he thought England yeah. was still like this, and the guy's just a dreamer, basically. You got you to gotta let him go on this one. You know? <laughs> so while uh, well, always writing about England in, in the 30s and these empires, Woodhouse was still living in the jazz age. Right? Yeah, the, exactly. The Depression. <laughs> and I think the main crux of the argument is, you know, Woodhouse is just so naive that he just doesn't realize that the world is changing around him, and he think he thinks he is still living in the jazz age. You know? Wow, that, that's 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 amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, we're gonna get to your book in a second, but first we have a two-minute uh, clip sent in from a fan. Oh wow! Hey, PJ and Dean, it's Casey from Casey's Bookshelf over on Instagram. I wanted to say happy anniversary and congratulations on a fantastic year of sharing your love of so many great books. I wish you both many, many more years of great reads and great conversations. I love the podcast and I have a book I want to share with you. I know you guys love the classics, so I wanted to share something a little more contemporary that may be a little outside of your wheelhouse. And that's Quan Berry's We Write Upon Sticks. The book's funny, fast paced, and a good time from start to finish. The story takes place in Danvers, Massachusetts, which is where the Salem Witch Trials began in 1692. Fast forward nearly 300 years later, and we're in 1989, focusing on a, a local high school women's uh, field hockey team who, despite a lot of heart and a lot of effort, just can't seem to win a game. That is until the summer before their senior year, the team's goalie decides to take matters into her own hands and calls upon some dark forces to help them out. And soon, one by one, the rest of the team joins in. It's honestly a really fun take on a subject matter that's been pretty deeply explored. The book's full of 80s iconography from movies to big hair, and it makes for a really, really fun read. And even though it's technically about a sports team, it never feels like a sports book. It's just a really interesting take on the witch trials. If you don't know, Quan Berry is an award-winning American poet. She grew up in the area the book is set in and even played for her local field hockey team. So she does a really great job of describing the game and the positions for those of us who may not be super familiar with the sport and does so in a very approachable and entertaining way that really feels like it adds to and is part of the story. Uh, and it never feels like you're reading like a rule book. I also happen to be pretty big on audiobooks, so if y'all or any of your listeners are into them too, this is a really great audiobook to check out. It's narr narrated by Isabel Keating, who is a spectacular voice actress who does an amazing job with this story. I highly recommend it. If y'all happen to check it out, uh, make sure to stop by my page and let me know what you think. Again, happy anniversary and congratulations. Bye! There we go. That was from Casey's bookshelf wow. on Instagram. Oh, wow, that was that's really lovely of you. Thanks for your lovely message. And I certainly want to check out that book. Well, that sounds just off my street, actually. Quanberry. Mm. Quanberry's We Ride Upon Sticks. 
Now, I think, come on, like, you know, I, 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 I saw you nodding your head. 80s, especially when she got to the 80s, the big yes. hair. Yes. Like, <laughs> I do. I, we, do, we do love an 80s aesthetic. Well, I do, especially. I'm, it's my, my whole jam. <laughs> and I love the witches, especially. I have a witch in my novel as well. So, I mean, that just sounds mm. just up my street. We ride upon sticks. Nice. A strange thing happened there, though, that I didn't know if you could hear the clip or not. So for two minutes, I was just looking like, I don't know if you can hear this. Is he sitting in silence for two minutes? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> oh, <laughs> OK. Well, it was just, it was just, oh. I'm, I'm, thank you very much for that lovely message. Really appreciate that. And it's nice to hear from our fans. So if yeah. anyone wants to say anything out. Anyone can uh, send it. Booksboys at hotmail.com. Send us a two minute clip. Tell us what you've been reading. And, you know, we are, we'll, we'll play it on the, on the radio. Indeed. PJ, wow. what have you been reading? So then I've been reading one of my favorite authors, Haruki Murakami, mm -hmm. who you know yourself. What I talk about when I talk about running. Have you ever heard of this book before? I, I've, I've read some Murakami that you've recommended before, but I have not heard of this yes. one. No, I've not read it. So this one is essentially a memoir talking about sports. It could be considered a sport book, although I think it's more, for me, it's more of a philosophical treatise on running per se. So what is it about? It's about um, Haruki Murakami is a Japanese novelist. His most famous novel is Norwegian Woods, which turned into a movie as well. He's famous for these surreal, some would say postmodern, some would say pop fiction novels. But uh, I, I love him because it's, it's always about these lonely characters who are essentially lost and sounds a bit like a, like a Norwegian character, except it's always Ooh. very surreal what's happening to them so talking cats and you know parallel universes and all kinds mm. of things but what i talk about when i talk about running is essentially about his experience with jogging and running which he's been doing since 1982 and he did this because he uh, Haruka Murakami was initially a jazz bar owner going late to bed and just writing in the wee hours of the of the dawn mm. and his health was basically going down the drains, as you can imagine. So he decided to both become a full-time novelist, which is his third novel, A Wild Sheep's, Sheep's Chase. And at the same time, he realized he could only do this if he physically came into, got into shape. So he started jogging. So he started a jogging routine simultaneously while he started his quite strict um, novelist routine. And Haruka Murakami has always had a very kind of, very strict routine. He wakes up at, 4 a.m. starts writing for for about six hours straight. Then he does then he jogs and he swims. Goes early to bed. Uh, very kind of yeah, for me that's very Japanese actually. Mm. So, and he talks about just well what what makes him a successful runner, but also what makes him a successful novelist in the sense that this routine works for him. So it's essentially um, it's very similar to the concept similar to Stephen King's on on writing. So it's a novelist talking about novel writing but he's talking about running at the same time and how it helps him and it's it's very readable as is all Murakami's books it's very engaging um it just talks about what he what he feels like when he's running and what sensations going to say what's the philosophy of running why do joggers run and I I really wanted to read this one because I've been getting back into running I've always enjoyed jogging and running and essentially I just want to tell a brief part of it was is he talks about running and he, people ask him what he thinks about when he's running and he says he well he doesn't think about anything if it's if he's feeling good he thinks a bit about feeling good okay if he feels cold he thinks about the cold a bit he feels so he's not using hot. it to you know philosophize or anything like that he's just in the moment exactly he's in the moment what he does he runs because he wants to create a void inside of him first of all he runs because it's what his body naturally wants and second of all he thinks the benefit of running for a novice is not to get inspired he says he doesn't pretty get inspired or have deep philosophical thoughts but it's actually to empty the mind and that's the way i feel honestly when i run mm. i feel i'm not particularly thinking about anything at all i'm just kind of letting all the head stuff go it's particularly if i had a very a very head brainy sort of day using my head a lot I'm kind of letting it go because especially if you want to be creative and you put too much into your head, I find nothing's going to come out. It's all jam. It's all mm. energy stuck. 
and basically by running you just you just kind of i imagine always you're running and you're slowly you know throwing a bit of that un, un, unnecessary thoughts away just kind of throwing away and making your head empty again so that when you sit back down again you're ready for some new ideas to come in and this novel is about that and about the um mm, about what it feels like for him to be running and then writing and he talks about he talks about um also and there's an interesting chapter here about what are the necessary qualities to become a not a successful novelist but just a just a novelist a, a person who writes on a consistent basis and let me just get it for you now Dean. Mm -hmm. in a second put this one out Excuse me. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So um, this is a very interesting part about about the, about the discipline of novel writing. So I'm just quoting. In every interview, I'm asked, "What's the most important quality a novelist has to have?" It's pretty obvious: talent. No matter how much enthusiasm and effort you put into writing, if you totally lack literary talent. If you can forget about being a novelist. This is more of a prerequisite than a necessary quality. If we don't have any fuel, even the best car won't run. The problem with talent, though, is that in most cases, the person involved can't control its amount or quality. You might find the amount isn't enough and you want to increase it, or you might try to be frugal to make it last longer. But in either case, do things work out that easily? Talent has a mind of its own and welds up when it wants to, and once it dries up, that's it. If I'm asked what the next most important quality is for novice, that's easy too. Focus. And then he talks about, in this part, just to summarize, he talks about that focus is absolutely necessary, but only able, you're only able to have focus if you don't have pain. And the problem is he talks that if, if novelists, they sit too long, they're going to develop a type of pain or discomfort, and that actually will distract you. Sure. Would allow you to have the the second quality um yes and the next quality he talks about the third is endurance being able to sit down three or four hours and give it all your attention similar to focus but actually being able to just stand that because he mm. talks about sometimes it being painful he also mentions for example uh, the mystery writer raymond chandler uh, raymond chandler actually uh, sat down every day for a few hours, even if nothing came up, just because it became a routine. So right. essentially, essentially, this is successful habits to acquire for for novelists. So he talks about, and he talks about that that you don't need to have talent as an sorry, excuse me, you need to have a certain amount of talent as a novelist, but it's not enough to be honest, because we don't have talent. If you have talent but no focus and endurance, it's just wasted. It's just yeah. going to be wasted. But if you have little talent, that's still okay as long as you've got a hell of focus and endurance and you start practicing. So it talks about writing down and practicing every day. It should be a routine. Mm -hmm. But Peach, I want to ask you a question because you, men you mentioned this idea of talent. Um, you know, there's a certain pot of talent and it will eventually run out. I mean, we, we're, we're creative types. You know, we both do artistic kinds of things. We, we, I, I paint, you make music and, and, and poetry and everything. Do, do you feel that like, you know, at some point, that's it? Like, do you think that you're going to run out of talent? Like, do you agree with that sentiment? No, uh, I don't think so. I um, don't think we're going to necessarily run out in, in town. But he says it could happen. And it has happened to some novelists where they just didn't write again. And you're kind of left wondering. Mm. I can't really imagine that, but it has happened to a few. I find it especially with artists that start off very, very young. And, they're, and, they're, and they've really produced some massive, massively great uh, novels at a young age. But then they run out a few or just the stuff they write later is not not as good. It doesn't seem to have the same the same mm, same appeal. And but he talks about that in the novels. So I'm just summarizing some briefly. He mm. talks about these these young novels, novelists especially, that do that, but because they don't have a routine, they kind of get lazy, they get slack. And he essentially talks about the power, he's always talking about the power between muscle building, especially in running. And a novelist, and he compares it to so when you got to jog, do a marathon, then you got to have endurance, you got to have focus. Uh, and he talks about, it leaves out the talent. You see, he says jogging is good to practice the, the next two things because talent is a prerequisite, but it's not enough. 
And especially if you've got little talent, he says himself, he has little talent. He, not, he doesn't consider himself a, he talks about there are Dickens and Shakespeare's in life, but there's not, most novelists need to really work on their endurance and focus. Yeah. And I, and I do see that a lot where you have, you have them for a while being stellar in their, in their production, but then they, they lose momentum, I suppose. Even Murakami, I, I, I love the man, but I don't feel that he's quite, the last few books I've read from him, the more recent ones, I don't feel are quite as powerful. Which is the one that I've read? Kafka on the Shore, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Kafka on the Shore. I love that one. Actually, it's good, but his writing style is a little unusual for me. I, 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 yeah? I don't know. Did yeah, you, I think so. Did you read Hardboiled Wonderland? Is that, did you also read that one? Also Not yet. That one? No. That one is absolutely my my favorite novel, and that's wow. quite an early novel. Um, yeah. But he talks about, honestly, I can see Murakami. I've read his first three novels. For example, I've read almost all of his novels. But the first three novels, the first two novels he wrote, he wrote it at, um, you know, spor- sporadically while he was working in jazz bar at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., before going to sleep. And then when he changed his routine, he completely changed his routine and he, he got up at 4 a.m. and started writing. Got up, he didn't go to bed. So it's mm-hmm. like the difference between waking up and writing is very different to going just before sleep. Isn't, isn't this a similar routine that you followed when you were writing? Like you were getting up really early and working um, and before doing your yeah, morning exercises yeah. and things, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So I, um, I also have a follow a similar routine. I also tried out uh, midday writing. It also worked for me for a while. But, uh, sorry, but the thing is, I always usually, almost always write after I sleep, after a big sleep, uh, nighttime. Uh, but it was my first novel, actually, I was just, it was my first novel, I wasn't waking up early. It was my first novel I was writing after having a siesta at 1 p.m. Mm-hmm. And then SPJ is in, is, is in uh, Grand Canaria, so he's allowed to have a siesta. He's in Spanish yeah, land. To have a siesta. <laughs> and then the daughter of his writing, so it's, it's an ideal life, yes. I'm very privileged. Um, but I suppose Murakami living in Tokyo is not really a thing you, you do there. So I can completely get it that mm. he wakes up early in the morning. It also works. Yeah, for me, it's a different writing style. But I suggest if you're becoming if you're becoming a writer, and especially in the, the discipline, this is a great kind of novelist discipline book, or at least recommendation. And I completely agree with physical activity, doing that before writing, mm-hmm. before writing, really kind of tire yourself out in some sense. He talks about pushing himself. He uh, is actually kind of he's a bit insane where coming, and I can totally oh. see that with his routine. He's always pushing himself. He actually says he his, his massage therapist says you, you should you know what are you doing you, you should be cramped up to the eyeballs I can't believe you've got <laughs> so much endurance so he actually does have wow a lot of endurance so I'm really enjoying this book read it it's a memoir he also talks about his life which and Murakami is very reclusive so it's actually nice to hear a bit about his life mm. and it's just a great read it's, um, especially if you're a Murakami fan or if you're a jogging fan or if you're into philosophy this is that more than anything is this philosophy. Or if you're an aspiring novelist or novelist trying to get some successful novelist habits. Heinrich. There we go. Like yourself. There we go. Brilliant. Uh, by the way, speaking of speaking of you being in uh, in, in Spain, so I was in Madrid uh, this month and I, I send you copious uh, books that I, I bought. I, I packed my little rucksack because I only went for a few days and I only brought a change of clothes. And that and little this... rucksack was packed with a dozen Spanish books, very heavy, but I didn't think I was going to get them through the airport. The, the amusing thing is uh, I talked to you just before you left and, and wrote to you like a big list, a big shopping list. Basically, I said, Dean, look, you're on the Spain. You got to got to get these got to get these novels. And these I got most of them, but I didn't think I would. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you said to them, look, I, bought, I can only buy two books. And then the next day, you said <laughs> of, of, of all these books, plus more from the same authors. So I'm, I'm glad you take my, um, you know, recommendations so seriously that you even buy more books. And, yeah, and, and, but, but and, BJ, I had no room in my suitcase for the Spanish ham. So how did you get them back to how did you get them back to Ireland? Did you sneak them through uh, the black market? Or something? Yeah, because I only brought hand luggage, and I just had this little rucksack <laughs> full of books <sighs> bulging from all the seams. I, you know, they I, I let used me to do the same it. though. <laughs> I used to do the same though. Uh, I, I, yeah, when yeah, uh, I essentially actually still do the same. I also put them into pockets, jack, jacket pockets, like stuffed them anywhere. When we stuff these books and I had to always oh try to make it look light. I had to wear three layers in the airport because yeah. I didn't have any room in my bag for my jumper or my coat. That's why I did. Uh, I, I used to, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, after, I, I've tried to get rid of that habit because I love books. But I just thought, oh no, I just, I can't 
because it was getting insane. Every every time I traveled, I just had three coats full of, of books, <laughs> and and it's all nonsense, really. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, oh wow! Did I tell you I'm going back to Madrid in four weeks? Yeah, you told me. Yeah, that. so I, I guess you, I'm going to do it all over it. again. This time I need to leave did, room for the ham. And and did you love the Museo de Prado? The yes, I loved the I loved the Prado wow. Museum. So I'm going to try to do another one um, when I go back. And guys, if you want to see my trip around Madrid on our Instagram, there's photos of all the bookshops I visited. I did a little yeah, awesome. a little hunt of different of all the bookshops in Madrid, including the Benito Perez Galdos uh, bookshop. Oh my you're, god! You're you're your chap, your friend. <laughs> Indeed, the basically the Dickens of Spain, Benito Perez Galdos. So, guys, yeah, if you're in Madrid, uh, check out the bookshop. If in case you're wondering, we're not actually sponsored by the Madrid Tourism Board, although I think <laughs> I think after this great sellout, they should give us a few we thousand. Should, quids. guys, come on. We're Just not sponsored by them, but you know who we are sponsored by this month? Uh, it's the Dickens Office of Circumlocution. So this is the office for not getting it done. So if there's ever something that you don't want to get done, but you want to go through a very lengthy bureaucratic pro uh, bureaucratic process of form filling and fee paying and stamping and bringing it to one clerk, to another clerk, to another clerk, only for several years later to eventually give up because it's bankrupted you and you've not achieved anything, then uh, the office wow. of circumlocution, guys, how not to get it done. There we go. What an investment. <laughs> Do it, guys. <laughs> We're going to take a 30 second break and play an ad from a podcast called The Paranoid Strain, uh, Friends of Ours, and we'll be back in a second. Edit, edit, edit. Okay, PJ, I'm going to tell you about one more thing I read. Do you remember we spoke to Leah Sackett? Indeed. I read some short stories of hers, and I, I even submitted a, a, a blurb for the, the back of the book. Um, Do you know what, Dean? You're not what? the only one who read her short stories oh. and submitted blurb for, for it's me. Go. I also read it. I it wasn't was sure if you'd, if you'd gotten around to reading them. So what did you think? Yeah, yeah, we're sure we talked about it, Dean. Can't remember, can't it? We talked about it. Well, I thought, I thought it was great. I thought it was really awesome. Um, the really unusual, well, I, I wasn't going to mention actually because you're not published yet. So I'm not sure how much I'm going to say. So I won't talk too much about the content. But what, what were you about to say? To yeah, I, I Sam, I, I didn't. You know, they're not out yet, so I don't want to. I don't want to go into them. But essentially, we want to build some excitement, guys. It's a great collection. It, it's yes. it's amazing. I actually I'm not really a fan of short stories in general, um, mm -hmm. because I often think that you don't get. It. I love that Dickens style, that character building. So I want a long piece of work. Mm. But these are short stories that I felt immediately invested in the characters in totally, totally. pretty much every story. I don't know it's... how she did it, but she made short stories have that level of character depth that that I look for in a full length novel. And every single story is amazing. It's it's amazing. Yes, Saka. We we thank you for letting us interview back in the uh, back in the early summer. And yes. Chef. they're amazing short stories guys look look out for this one every short story sticks with you i must say it took me a while to read them because they're so strong and shocking and i had to stop reading a few times because they're really really shocking some of them because it's all about death it's all about grief and and mistakes and terrible tragedy happening how dealing with it mm -hmm. So the collection's called You Don't Know Who You Are. It's not a light read, oh, let's be ahead. honest. It's not a light Although read, Although no. one or two of the stories... I was, just, I was just saying, no, but one or two stories are really fun. There's humor as well. Like, uh, I particularly enjoyed... Uh, I particularly enjoyed the one about... Well, the one about the boy being bullied and what the uh, disabled man did to yes. the secret bench. Oh my God, that was... That was <laughs> there, 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 is a, there is a little bit of humor, um, but these, these feel like real people to me, you know, with real... Yeah. So the, fir the first half is about grief. And then the second set of stories are incarceration nation. So it's it's about, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of prison, not necessarily a physical prison. It could be almost be mental, but it's it's just wow. these, these um, kind of entrapment. The, the collection is called You Don't Know Who You Are Until You've Gone Too Far. Uh, I'm not even sure when it comes out, but I will, we'll let you know when it does come out. A really, mm -hmm. really wonderful and very powerful set of stories. Totally, yes. And, and, the, and it's got characters from children, a lot of children, actually, a lot of young kind of people and it's it's even got there's even one about basically it's an insinuate that he's a child molester it's got it's got some very dark characters in it up to like the very innocent and Lisa is, is very inspired by Alice in Wonderland as she mentioned herself 
And it's obvious there is it's 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 coherent. They're coherent stories. They're not losing logic like in Alice of Wonderland. But there's a sense of going down the rabbit hole of insanity, of darkness, and yes, and also losing a sense of dimension, losing oneself. It's got some very powerful imagery. I don't want to spoil it, but there's one imagery that's still in my head, which is a, a boy going into a, a liquor store and actually and, and just making mm -hmm. all the bottles fall down and crash to the Smashes floor the up, yeah. be because his yes because his uh, um, well I don't want to spoil it but because let's say a person very important for him was, was an alcoholic so that's his way of seeking revenge I, I thought that was a very powerful image from all of them that was probably my favorite story and it's, it's, it's great and really it's a mixture between I do love actually short stories so I, I really thought they remind me a bit about a bit of Stephen King short stories but also a bit of uh, that, that horror element or but also the Alice Munro short stories because she talks a lot about human relationships especially from a woman's perspective a bit of Margaret Atwood with that dystopian element so please guys have a read we'll mention it again when it comes out great read mm -hmm. and here's something we have um talked about this before but one one day we're gonna do an episode all about dystopian novels so we'll talk oh. about 1984 brave new world whatever else is in there handmaid's tale so that's coming one day next year maybe <laughs> exciting stuff yes. um, i i also read one more one more book pj um at, at a request of the author and um, so i'm gonna play oh. the little clip that he sent me here and um, this oh, is wow. a book called winterset hollow now pj this is my halloween recommendation this oh, wow. book was amazing was so powerful i i don't even know where to start but i've got a 30 second clip from the author asking us to review it so i'll play that real quick and then i'll talk about it go ahead uh, hey guys this is uh, jonathan edward durham out in california i just wanted to call to say i've really been enjoying the show lately and that i just released a new book this month that i really think you guys would like uh, it's called winterset hollow it's a contemporary dark fantasy, and I think it would be uh, just perfect for the show uh, for an October episode, uh, maybe a couple weeks before Halloween or somewhere around there. So I um, highly recommend you guys check it out. And if you do, I really hope you enjoy the book and keep up the good work. And uh, that's all I got for now. Peace. So thank you very much, Jonathan. And this was a, a wonderful book. So here's a tie-in. I had prepared a tie-in like a real professional because we know that we were talking about Leah Sackett and she loves Alice in Wonderland. This book has an Alice in Wonderland kind of vibe. Oh. Um, so you see the cover there, we have a little uh, yeah. rabbit fellow. So this starts out like a lovely, happy, Im imagine um, a land with these an anthropomorphic animals. There's a rabbit, a uh, runny, there's a frog, flackwell, there's Bingham the bear and there's Phineas the fox um, and they're living in this world and it's like it's almost like a children's story it's a lovely little thing and then the buffalo come and and you know then they they um it gets dangerous and it gets violent and they they shouldn't have done they they left their safe little place and they encountered the buffalo and um, but it's all a metaphor the buffalo are the humans actually destroying you know nature and destroying the world um so it's a lovely book, and these these people, Eamon and his friends, they they read the book, and it's really it's it's helped them through some tough times. It's oh, wait, wait, there's a oh, there's a book in the book. It's it's a book the within a book, yeah. Okay, okay. So in the real in the in, that's the book within the book. In the normal book, we have Eamon and his friends, and they say, well, it's barley day. So the the, the book within the book is all about celebrating barley day. So they say, no, it's barley day. Let's go to the author's house. The author's dead, but they say he lives on an island, isolated. Let's take a pilgrimage to his house and celebrate, you know, his day at his house. And this is like an annual pilgrimage. So they go and then they, you know, they kind of break into the house, essentially. They sneak through the fence, and they go into the grounds. And all of a sudden, it's the real characters from the book. It's the rabbit and the fox and the bear and the frog. And oh, they wow. serve them a meal for barley day. And it's part of the tradition. And it starts out almost like, a, you know, in this sense, it's almost like a children's book. Wow. And then they say, well, what's the real Barley Day tradition? It's the hunt. And then the book just flips and the animals want to kill the humans. And I don't want to spoil like anything really beyond that. Amazing. But like then it becomes like a dark survival action, you know, book horror almost at times, like where, where the animals are, are hunting the humans because they're saying this author, you know, took us from our homes. You know, you think that he gave you a happy little story about happy little animals. He took us from our homes. 
his his people destroyed our home they killed all of our relatives all of our other animal family tortured us kept us in cages wow. he's a horrible person that you all idolize and we want to punish all these humans who come here wow it's amazing what i love that uh, it's, it's very, ama- very it blew my mind it sounds very battle royale-esque the, uh, that part there sort of yeah in the, in the second off. half it is it is quite battle royale-esque but that flip the, the juxtaposition of like happy children's book, you know, and it literally starts like Alice in Wonderland. He follows a rabbit through a maze onto a big chessboard. And, you know, it, it, it's giving you these like childish playful yeah. vibes. But the Wonderland wow. is, is, a, is a nightmare skip. <laughs> wow. OK, that, that's that's amazing. And they want to escape yeah. and they want to get off the island. Um, it's maybe one of the most powerful books I've read in a, in a long, long time. And it wow. gets very dark intricate scene you know detailed descriptions of of violence that you don't expect from the the happy little parts about the little rabbits you know skipping around the meadow and cooking food for each other and having a nice little time you know it's and he, and it's the, every every the book's divided into five sections and each section starts with one page of a poem about these animals playing in their happy little place wow and it's it's just so wonderfully done And even in the dusk, he saw the red among the grass, the spot he'd set the jewel for which the buffalo had asked. And there next to his kindred bear, old Runny sat and cried with no one near to shed a tear for the rabbit in the rye. This, everyone needs to go and read this book. It's called Winterset Hollow. It's amazing. What's the name of the author again? The author is Jonathan Edward Durham, and his website is just his name, jonathanedwarddurham.com, but I'll put a, I'll put okay. a link in the, in the well, show. I'll, de- I'll definitely read that book, uh, Jonathan, and as soon as I get back to Ireland, and and I, I'd love to lend a, I love to I'll, I'll, that. I'll, yeah, I'll give it to you, I'll post it to you, whatever. Oh, hold wow, on a second. Amazing. I, I love I that think, plot. Uh, I think I hear the phone ringing, two seconds. Oh my God. And then edit in the interview. Wow. Well, guys, that's all the stuff I've I've read. Wow. Uh, we're all we're almost done, but I just want to take two seconds to. It's our one year anniversary, and I just want to thank you know the TNC Network who who help us out, and um, also Radio Oxon, where we our show was played on the radio, and just all the listeners really. And we're up to almost eight hundred followers on Instagram, for example. So we get a lot of interaction from from people, and it's really nice to have. So I just want to thank everyone. Wow. And PJ, shall we do some recommendations? Octane, it's just like with our last Halloween recommendations. Ah, go back to the episode, guys. I, those, there are particular talk about Battle Royale. I did recommend that one, but there are, I have to recommend three ones, three books. I'm sorry. I have to go okay. and recommend three books. And the first one is Clive Barker with his amazing book. Well, he's got so many amazing books, actually, but I would have to, I would have to choose for Halloween. Um, his one and only The Great and Secret Show from his Books of the Art series, which is basically uh, about these mm, these spirits uh, combining and creating mayhem across uh, like a district in California, creating a huge earthquake, which related uh, to a basic connection between these these uh, people it's, it's very mysterious it's uh, i don't want to say too much about the plot let's just say it's about the end of the world and the conflict between two two spirits who are just fighting to become the most powerful um he has says uh, clive barker did say it was the hardest book uh, for him to write but i'm telling you it's a very easy uh, book okay. to read it, it, it captivated it is like with all clive barker's books equally like was the author you just mentioned, mm-hmm. um, was author that was just interviewed. A very disturbing. Uh, Clive Barker is ha- has a very dark side, um, very fairy tale esque side. I particularly like his um, series of books, the Aberrat books. Okay. Really love those. But the Great and Secret Show is great. It's got all kinds of amazing mytho- mythological metaphors and. It's the end of the world, essentially. And the sequel is not as powerful ever, Will, but I re- recommend you to read at least The Great and Secret Show. Equally from the UK, Neil Gaiman. I always think about mm-hmm. them too for some reason. Both of them are very kind of sweet, man. I mm-hmm. really like them in the interviews. They sound like very lovely. And yet they've got kind of very dark sides as well. Yeah. And Neil Gaiman, famous for Sandman comics, has got a lot of great books, but I've got to recommend uh, The Graveyard Book which is a lighter book. It's not a deeply disturbing book. It's probably for kids, 
and it's essentially the Jungle Book, uh, the Jungle Book story in the graveyard. So oh, an okay. orphan boy taking care of, of ghosts. And it's a, it's a lighter read than the Great and Secret show. It's essentially for kids, but Neil Gaiman, I, f- I find his prose is always immaculate. It's like perfect. Mm. You don't need to edit a single word. And I often find that with children uh, books authors in general, especially the great ones, that, wow, you're better off writing shorter fiction and better. Yeah. And I really love this story in particular. It's funny. It's got, as always, with Neil Gaiman's got some intricate, disturbing villains as well. Um, yeah, I love But PJ, don't film. you think it would have been improved with a 700-page farming manual? I, I think we should write to Neil Gaiman himself <laughs> and say, look, I don't know what you were thinking. Were it's an oversight, clearly. A, a mistake. Or fishing manual. <laughs> or fishing manual, yeah. <laughs> And Dean, I've got a one more recommendation. I know I'm going over my head here, but I just want to recommend, I recommended before, this is what I read Halloween, and I don't think you agree with this, but I read the Italian one and only, the Dylan... Oh, no, the, the, the Dylan... Dylan Cut. Oh. The, the, the Dylan Dog comics. Now, I've tried um, making Dean read this. I just want to say, Dean, that Umber- Umberto Eco considered very intellectual writer once said he reads three books uh all over all over the artists say the bible and the dylan dog comics because wow. the dylan dog comics are literally they're incredibly densely philosophical and deeply disturbing at times mm-hmm. as well so we There's have no- you know we have uh, batman versus superman maybe a cameo from spider-man Dave, all that kind of uh-huh. stuff right exactly <laughs> you got all that and a bit of disney cartoon in there <laughs> anyway, please read uh, Dylan Dog, guys. It, the first um, six volumes have been released in English. If you can't read it in other languages, it is freaky, philosophically great. So any Dylan Dog comic. But, of course, I, I always think uh, my favorite one, my favorite Dylan Dog comic is... Um, okay, I think of the other part. I forgot what that name was. <laughs> Wait, wait one second, Dean. Just wait one second. It's gonna. Can we edit that part out? Sure. Okay. My favorite. It's got to be Batman versus Superman. It's it's right up there. It's got to be Batman versus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hold on a second. One second. I've got it now. Okay, guys, do yourself in favor and read volume three. Le Notte de la Luna Piena, the nights, the nights of the full moon, all about werewolves and the most incredible graphics you've ever seen in any comic, possibly. Okay. All right. So, for so forgive Dean for his lack no, of knowledge. A, of I'm, the I'm art. uncultured when it comes to the is it the, the ninth art? Is it? <laughs> I think it's the ninth or the eighth art. Mm. They they yes, guys. So comics <laughs> are considered the last art, but anyway, I'm a big fan of them. So. Yeah. Big recommendations. But guys, they're, they're the last arc. So if you're just busy working your way through the others, <laughs> and you don't get time to, to make it onto them. It's fine. You know, don't worry. <laughs> uh, guys, let's let's quickly talk about our, um, if you want to get more of us, um, go to patreon.com slash booksboys. What have we released in the last month alone since we last did Booksboys episode 12? We did Caper Captains episode seven. Some are born to sleep, del- sweet delight and some are born to endless night. I've released several episodes of forensic friends which oh. is the ancient greek court speeches those are always fun to look at the little mini episodes um and i've got recently just up another interview from the vault with the rock band 10 year vamp like a female fronted punk rock band and uh, oh. episode one of music men all of our halloween songs so they're they're original music there's so much on there guys um for the price of a cup of coffee per month, um, you can, uh, you know, get so much content. Playboys is on there, our Shakespeare's, like the Christie's, just so much. Guys, so feel free and check check in. We love your support. We love your feedback. And we're here to serve you. And we will be doing some more Playboys um, before the end of the year. So there'll be, there'll be a few more of those up for the, oh, yeah. the Shakespeareites out there. With some maybe including some Shakespearean guests. We will have a, we will have guests. Yes, we'll have a, a well, listen and find out. We will have we will have guests. Um I think today, PJ, we might close with your song Jurassic Park. Does that seem well, suitably Halloween-y? But what about your recommendation? Oh goodness, I forgot my own recommendations. Damn. Well, I, we I do hear. have two. Um I recommend, first of all, because I talked about Orwell, I recommend Animal Farm. 
because um, mm-hmm. that's one that's accessible even for you know a 12 year old could, could, can read that you know um, and I think that it should be mandatory reading I think actually I think that every every 12 year old should have to read Animal Farm and then every 16 year old should have to read 1984 and that should be mandatory but um, I, I really recommend Animal Farm you all know the story so I'm not going to go into it but it is a good one um, which brings us of course to this month's second sponsor Boxer's Glue so if you ever want your friendly anthropomorphic uh, animals and you want to then use them as glue after they've gone to the knacker's yard that's very sad but you can boxersglue.gov and you can uh, eat your uh, use your friends to, to glue things together um, my other recommendation it's a Halloween one guys it's uh, Jekyll and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde the strange spooky case uh, Robert Louis Stevenson because it's just again you know the story but I saw a theatrical production a year or two ago it was amazing I uh, it's you know everything's oh your your comic book tie in PJ the Incredible Hulk is a version of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde so there <laughs> comic comic books boys episode two point five you, you've you've mentioned a comic <laughs> Dean there you go <laughs> so there we go I've got a tie in but yeah Jekyll and Hyde I think it's a fun one for Halloween um my real recommendation is Dracula but I used that last year mm. so I th- but yeah what do you think about playing Jurassic Park do you think that's suitable to to close a Halloween episode I think spooky. Go ahead. And I'm very disappointed that you didn't uh, bring your your candle uh, like you did before and sit out in the dark. Uh, oh yes, to, to exactly. host the Halloween episode. <laughs> Very spooky, uh, spooky candles. Well, guys, thank you to everyone who sent us in um, clips and things. And again, you can do that at booksboys at hotmail.com. Tell us what you're reading. Uh, thanks to Jonathan Edward Durham as well for calling in and for for also you know writing such an amazing book. Leah Sackett wow. with her amazing short stories. Just thanks to everyone. And um, it's been so so amazing hitting our one year anniversary episode. We will be back, of course, next month. Um, head up booksboys.com. And if you want more, patreon.com slash booksboys. And that is our one year show. Happy Halloween, everyone. And we'll Happy be back Halloween. in about a month. Spooky.